Good evening, and welcome to the Senate and House Candidate Forum for District 64. I'm Kitty Goggins, a lead trained moderator and member. Today's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul in partnership with the Highland District Council, the McAllister Groveland Community Council, the Saint, and the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. On behalf of the sponsor groups, I would like to welcome all of you tonight, the candidates, those who have joined us live audience, as well as those who will be viewing this forum virtually. The forum will last approximately one and a half hours. We believe the success of our state depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office in Minnesota. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate candidates and audience members taking the time to be here tonight. This year, the constituents of District 64 are electing a senator and House representatives. All eligible candidates listed on the Minnesota Secretary of State website were invited to participate, and five of the six are appearing here tonight. Each participating candidate has agreed to the rules which were included in their invitation. Each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement. The candidates will then have one minute to answer each question posed. Rebuttals are only allowed if a candidate is called out by name by another candidate, and it will be timed at 30 seconds. Candidate order for the opening statements in the question was set using a random number generator. At the end of the question period, each candidate will have two minutes for closing statements in the reverse order of the opening statements. We'll use questions written by the audience here today, as well as questions that were submitted in advance to the St. Paul League. Questions can be written on index cards provided by League volunteers and can be submitted to the League volunteers throughout the forum. And if you look there, you can see somebody has got a card ready to go. Wonderful. Um, all questions must be addre addressed to all candidates, and no personal or attacking questions will be allowed. All questions become the property of the League of Women Voters. Answers to the questions similarly need to focus on the questions themselves. A candidate's record may be discussed, but personal attacks will not be tolerated. A timer will signal candidates when they have 30 seconds remaining and where their time is up. When the timer puts up a stop card, candidates need to conclude. Candidates, you can finish your sentence, but I will enforce this rule to make sure we have the same amount of time for each of the candidates. We ask that the audience hold all applause until the end of the forum this evening. The forum is being video recorded by St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. Recording in the forum will be available on multiple platforms. Recording this event, whether they be in person or on a computer screen, may not be used without the express written approval of the League. The League will only allow audio and video of this event to be broadcast in its entirely, entirety, except by the media reporting on the event. Now, let me introduce the candidates that are participating in this evening's forum by office they are seeking in alphabetical order by name. Candidates for Senate District 64, Robert Bouchard and Aaron Murphy. Candidates for House District 64A, um, Ka, uh, Kali Bang Her and Dan Walsh. Candidates for House District 64B, Dave Pinto. Lorraine England is not appearing here tonight. We now begin with opening statements. Remember, you have two minutes for each response, and we will be starting with um, Kaylee, Kaylee, sorry, I'm sorry, Kali, Kali Vang Her. I apologize for that. Thank you. Um, I think, is, are you scorekeeping? I mean, um, timekeeper, <laughs> just sorry. <laughs> Not scorekeeping, timekeeping, thank you. Um, so I'm Kali Vang Her. I am the House Majority Whip. And, um, you know, my family has uh, been in, in this country for 45 years. I came here as a refugee when I was four years old. And we were some of the first, my family was some of the first uh, to re, uh, settle here in St. Paul. We have roots from the west side to the east side to Frogtown, uh, which, um, you know, we were some of the first beneficiaries of uh, the dollar house that allowed us to own uh, our homes and 
um, you know, move up with uh, building of wealth, and so I'm really proud of that. Um, over the last 45 years, uh, we have established strong roots here in the city of St. Paul. My grandfather was the first Hmong Methodist pastor in the country here in Minnesota, when he became a pastor here in Minnesota. He was also the first Hmong police chaplain, making him the first Hmong uh, chaplain uh, in the country when he became, uh, when he was um, serving in St. Paul uh, Police Department. And um, as an ex a refugee, I've experienced poverty, food insecurity, and also health disparities that impacted myself and my family. But that would not become the de uh, determining factors for my outcome in that I have received uh, much support from my faith community and also uh, government safety net programs, which allowed me to complete my uh, bachelor's degree in finance investments and investments, my MBA. And currently, I am pursuing my doctorate in ed uh, education leadership at the University of St. Thomas. Um, some notable bills that I have been able to uh, get passed through as a, a first-termer in uh, the legislature is eliminating child marriage bill, uh, prevent insurance companies from discriminating against people who are organ donors or marrow donors. Uh, they're fully funding uh, foster uh, children who are in the foster care system for higher education, and also prorated rent to protect those who are not being fairly charged their uh, rent, um, and also the microgrid bill for the University of St. Thomas, which I'm all very proud of because it's all in different areas. And um, I've also had the privilege of raising two brilliant girls that went to school through the St. Paul Public School Systems. And uh, I continue to call St. Paul my home with my husband and my daughters. And it has been the honor of my life to serve the constituents in 64A. And Please so- Please complete uh, your statement. <laughs> I'm bragging it right now. And so I look, I look forward to continuing to serve the residents here. Thank you, Kali Vang Her. Next, we have Robert Bouchard. I'm a lifelong resident of uh, Marion Park. Uh, I like cops. I like cars. I like safe streets and cities. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I volunteered to go. I didn't have to go, but they had some, uh, I was trained on some secret electronic equipment, which uh, they were installing in Vietnam. And uh, after one year on top of a mountain in Greece, uh, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. Uh, I got carjacked. On Valentine's Day, I stopped a robbery two weeks after the riots on Marshall and Cleveland. My brother tells me, move out of St. Paul, the crime's getting crazy. Just 14 days ago, 3 o'clock in the morning, five shots right outside my window on Cleveland and St. Anthony. I told my brother, uh, we ran from Saigon, we ran from Kabul, we ran from Benghazi. I'm not running from my home, I'm running for the state senate to eliminate crime, inflation, and government overreach. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Bouchard. Next, we have Dan Walsh. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dan Walsh. I was born and raised 1707 Juliet Avenue, uh, second generation activity, third generation Cretan. So this playground here, I used to know it as Hillcrest back in the day. So the neighborhood and this facility have certainly changed. I'm very impressed. Um, my career has been in corporate America uh, the last 20 years, specifically in cybersecurity. Um, there's a lot of parallels between cybersecurity and security in general. And so the main reason, like Robert articulated recently, I'm running is because I see a trajectory here and I don't see a lot of accountability and responsibility. In fact, this coffee I bought tonight. I bought it at the Safeway on Grand and Milton. And unfortunately, there's plywood on the windows of Grand and Milton Safeway right now. And I think we can all probably reach out very closely to people around our community and hear these stories. So something has to be done. And it takes a lot of political will to do that. And it takes change to do that. And right now, I don't see anyone articulating, standing up, and defending our first liners, who, by the way, I grew up with. I have personal connections with most of us in St. Paul do. So the main reason, safe communities, because without safe communities, we don't have a whole lot to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Walsh. Next, we have Aaron Murphy. Thank you everybody for being here. My name is Erin Murphy. I'm a registered nurse, I'm a mom, and I teach in the School of Nursing at St. Kate's University. 
I serve currently in the Minnesota Senate uh, and served for 12 years in the Minnesota House, uh, gratefully representing the mighty citizens, citizens of District 64A. And Minnesotans, over my number of years uh, serving in elected office, have taught me so much about Minnesota, about our aspirations, about our way of life. And they have shown us over and over again, they've shown me over and over again, that they are expecting a government that will serve them. Uh, and in my tenure, what I have learned is that if we lead with hope and with purpose, we can make real progress for the people of Minnesota. I ran for the Minnesota Senate after two years of considering uh, what I'd learned running statewide when I ran for governor. And that race in particular taught me that there's every reason to hope and that a hopeful politics actually delivers more for the people of Minnesota. For the last two years, I've served in a Minnesota Senate that has been led by a Republican majority that continues to grow more extreme a Republican majority that at the end of the session walked away without doing its job for the people of Minnesota, despite reaching an agreement with the governor and reaching an agreement with the Speaker of the House. And the people who paid for that sitting down in the job were the people of Minnesota, and that's not how we build our future. I believe deeply in the kind of politics that improves people's lives. I am deeply committed to that work and to the future of the people of Minnesota. I ask respectfully for your vote, and I will continue to work every day for you and for our future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron Murphy. Dave Pinto. Uh, hello, um, Dave Pinto, um, uh, current representative for 64B, the southwest part of St. Paul, including this area, of course. And I spent a lot of time in this room. I was on the Highland District Council back in the day, and it's so nice to be back. Um, I work outside the legislature as a prosecutor. Um, I've specialized in particular in gender violence, but have worked um, in the wide range of issues there. Uh, and, um, and so I've brought that knowledge to the work at the Capitol, um, in particular addressing gun violence, which is a huge concern uh, in our community and in our state, in our country. I'm the author of the bill for criminal background checks. We want to make sure that people who've shown themselves to be dangerous um, would uh, we'd take steps to, to keep them away from firearms. Uh, and then also, I'm the chair of the Early Child Commi Committee in the House. Um, I've seen as a prosecutor how far off people's trajectories can get, and I want to make sure that we give every young person uh, and every young child in Minnesota a great start in life so they can get on that better trajectory. So I focused especially in those areas. Um, what I found, though, is that the best way to give young kids a great start is to support their families and support their communities, make sure that people have an affordable, stable place to live, that they have um, health care that they can afford um, and that is accessible to them as well, um, that we have clean air and water um, and a healthy planet, um, that we have these things that can make sure that every single person in our state can thrive. That is my goal, is to um, come together with colleagues and to allow each person in our state to thrive. I know that when we do that, will make a difference for the rest of us as well. I'm really looking forward to this discussion tonight, and I appreciate the, uh, the time and the league for putting it together. Thanks so much. Thank you for the opening statements. We'll now move on to questions. The first question, what would be your top three priorities if elected? What would be your top three priorities if elected? And this question first is will be answered by Robert Bouchard. Uh, top three priorities. Number one, I would tell uh, St. Paul and Minneapolis that they're, I'm not going to vote for any aid for potholes, bike lanes, or other amenities until they properly fund the police, prosecute criminals, uh, convict the criminals, and put them in jail for the duration of their term. Uh, to uh, and help on the inflation front, I would want the government to return the surplus, which I believe the government believes is their profit. No, it's our change. Give us our change back, and that's not the only change we need. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert Bouchard. Um, second on this question, we have Aaron Murphy. Thank you very much. Uh, when we come into the next term, uh, we will be fortunate to have many, many new legislators, in part because of redistricting, in part because of retirements. And that gives us a, a really wonderful opportunity uh, to focus on our future. 
Uh, all of these candidates who are running, those of us here are running, are talking with Minnesotans, many of us at the doorsteps of Minnesotans, and we're gonna come into office uh, full of ideas, full of ambition for the people of Minnesota. I wanna make sure in this next term that we pass a structurally balanced budget. It is something that we lacked when I was first elected, but we achieved back in 2013 and 14. And without a structurally balanced budget, we can't properly fund our schools, our infrastructure, our public safety, or housing. Any of the issues that we rely on together, we won't accomplish. I'm gonna focus on the issue of equity to make sure that everyone has a real opportunity in the state of Minnesota, and right now, that's absent. And last, I'm gonna to continue to build the kind of politics that serves the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Murphy, next we have Dave Pinto. I mentioned, I mentioned two areas that I focus on in particular. Uh, in the area of uh, public safety and community safety, what I would like to do is to um, finally pass the package of investments and reforms that we passed in the Minnesota House um, through the DFL this spring. We passed uh, significantly more funding for police officers and for law enforcement, along with community violence prevention efforts, along with reform and accountability. Um, and unfortunately, could not get, for whatever reason, the Republican Senate to go along with that. Um, and oddly enough, despite what you might think, in fact, it was, uh, it was the Democrats uh, who were eager to push that forward and make sure that we're investing in community safety. That's a high priority. And then another one is, again, as I said, to get young kids off to a great start, because we know that we make those investments, that they'll make a big difference for uh, all through the rest of life. We're talking about affordable childcare for families, which will actually address the worker shortage that we have and get providing high quality early experiences as part of that as well, which will have a huge effect um, all throughout the process later in terms of saving money and making a really big difference. Thanks. Thank you, Dave Pinto. Dan Walsh. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, again, Representative Pinto hit it. Yeah, funding is one element that we need to accomplish and there has been some movement forward on that, but tone attitude, that needs to change. I don't see anyone standing up for our frontliners and pushing back on a narrative that is absolutely false. The narrative between reality, the gap is so big, it's unbelievable. But yet we hear it every day and I don't see anyone standing up and say, no, that's not right. Here is how many people, here's the historical data. So yeah, funding's part of it, but tone, that's the only issue that matters right now. We need a safe community because all else falls without a safe community. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Walsh. And last on this question, we have Kali her. Thank you, and uh, I would agree with both my colleagues, Aaron and Dave, on the priorities and how we're gonna go about doing this. And I would just add that for me, I sit on taxes, and for us to have put together a, a really comprehensive tax bill that did not get um, passed uh, because our Republican colleagues would not come to the table and come to agreement with us on this, that would have included um, huge um, tax credits that have put money back right into Minnesotans' pockets to help address the, the issues that they're experiencing now with higher prices. And so I'm committed to going back to doing that uh, and protecting our seniors with Social Security uh, support. And then also um, looking at affordable housing and uh, what I've heard uh, from uh, campaigning across the state is that reproductive rights is a huge issue and that I am committed to ensuring that we protect women's ability to choose for their own bodies. Thank you, Kali Van Her. Van Her. Um, next uh, question is, cost of health care continues to be a challenge for many, America, many Minnesotans. How will you address health care affordability and access? Cost of health care continues to be a challenge for many Minnesotans. How will you address health care affordability and access? First on this question is Dan Walsh. Thank you. Well, if we see anything, we've seen that there's been a lot of waste in the health care provided by the state of Minnesota, specifically the HHS, to the tribes and the other entities. So you start by tightening up your ship, taking the fraud out of the program, getting some oversight and some audit capabilities, and also innovation, but also entering into a competitive situation. Nothing drives costs lower than competition. As we work and as people continue to work towards this single payer dream, it does not provide availability, it does not provide affordability, and it does not provide the ability for people to have choice. And that's what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Second on this one is Kali Vanger. Thank you for the question. and I. Uh, 
would say that uh, I am in support of a single payer system. Um, as someone who has actually sat down with hospitals and clinics, uh, nonprofit um, providers, and uh, private insurers, I've uh, sat across the spectrum trying to figure out why does the healthcare cost so much. Um, I would say that it is not really fraud that is causing our systems and the issues here. It is really uh, a system that uh, where uh, the people who are players are not always good actors. Uh, cost is not consistent across the board. Um, and what is provided to people is not always um, what is uh, stated. And so we need to have a more transparent system. And we can achieve some of this through the single payer system. And that's what I would continue to support and push forward. Thank you, Kelly. Next, we have Robert Bouchard. Um, I would like to say that my uh, nephew complains to me all the time about since Obamacare was passed, his uh, deductible is $10,000 and his cost is over 5000 when his deductible used to be 5000 his cost was 300 That's annually. Um, so I'm against this uh, single-payer system. Uh, the competition is what really uh, drives costs down for insurance, and that's my answer. Thank you, Robert. Next we have Dave Pinto. I'm a member of the Minnesota Health Plan Caucus and, and supportive as well for uh, taking that kind of broad approach. I, I want to make sure folks are aware, um, countries around the world, countries that we would compare ourselves to, have a system where uh, everybody recognizes that health care isn't going to be a need for everybody throughout their lives. And these are countries that make sure through a variety of mechanisms that people, in fact, have access to health care healthcare that they need. These countries pay significantly less than we do for health care in total, and they cover more of their citizens and their residents, and they have uh, better, better measures um, and uh, better quality measures. Um, we have got pharmaceutical costs that are very high. We have all kinds of things that drive up our health care costs. Um, but at the moment, what we're not doing is going with what countries around the world are doing to say, and, and have done for decades, I'll point out, um, to have a system that provides uh, health coverage for every single person in their society. So we have this, this fragmented system that leaves a lot of people out without health coverage at all. That, to my mind, is not the way to do it. And we talk about um, affordability and access. That's how we get access, and that's how we make it affordable. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Aaron Murphy. Thank you. Uh, I have been a registered nurse since 1985, and I have watched our health care system continue to move to a system of profit uh, rooted in competition among systems to make money rather than a system of care. And it is, it is disturbing to continue to watch that trend and watch, that, watch what that means for family budgets, including increasing deductibles which are a feature of a for-profit competitive system and not a feature of a system that cares for people. I support a single-payer system because I think we have to put patients first. That's got to come before everything else. And we have the means to actually move in this direction in the state of Minnesota, and we have long been a leader uh, on the issue of health care and believe that we can continue to build on the system that we have in place founded on Minnesota Care, which passed, was passed back in 1991. We can use direct contracting to take the power of the health plans out of the system, and we can put patients back in the center of the system again Please with complete. a well-trained workforce um, that can actually provide care for the people who need it. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. This next question, uh, given the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Roe versus Wade, state legislators may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health? Given the recent Supreme Court ruling regarding Roe v. Wade, state legislatures may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health? First on this question is Dan Walsh. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know what needs to be done. It's a constitutional right. And I see that the Democratic Party is going to put it on the bill. You see the ads. You see the TV commercials. But right now, it's a constitutional right. So for me, abortion's not on the bill. Crime is, but not abortion. And I think if you look at the, just to offer an opinion, if you look at what the national polls say, 
most people do agree with controls and limits on abortion. So, but in Minnesota, it's in the Constitution, so I don't know what legislation needs to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Second is Robert Bouchard. Uh, I am absolutely appalled by the subject of abortion, um, especially late-term abortion. But like Dan said, it's not on the ballot. It's guaranteed by the Constitution. And I think we'd be better served by protecting the children that exist right now from teachers that are telling them little boys that they're girls and little girls that they're boys. And maybe they should uh, start teaching in schools uh, six of the Ten Commandments. The first four deal with God, the next deal with reality. How about thou shalt not steal? If uh, people respected other people's property, other people's lives, other people's goods, there's a good chance that the upcoming generation can be saved from the travesty that I see going on right now. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next, we have Dave Pinto. Uh, I'll admit to finding it pretty shocking that a political party that spent so many years and decades telling women um, that they want to control their bodies, the party wanted to, and that the government should, is now as soon as um, uh, the politics is shifting, suddenly we're running away and saying, oh, no, 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 um, we are uh, we're taking a different position or this is not really an issue. Um, Absolutely, um, the right to control one's own body is absolutely on the ballot in November. I don't see how you could think that it, that it would not be. Um, the, the, the Dobbs decision uh, overturned 50 years of precedent um, that allowed people to uh, have this right, and the Supreme Court says it's now tossed into the states. Um, your state legislator and, your, frankly, your governor and the other statewide elected officials um, absolutely will have control over that issue, um, and uh, we need to keep this in mind. So, um, of course, there are certainly steps that we want to be taking to vindicate that right. We want to be protecting people who are in other states who do not have access to abortion care, that they would be um, protected and provide support um, for them as well. This is fundamentally a religious freedom issue on top of all the other things. Not every faith believes that life begins at a given time or another time. So let's make sure to respect Please. one another and um, th thank you. Thank you, Dave. Next is Aaron Murphy. I think only people whose rights are not being threatened by the rash action of the Supreme Court could sit here with a straight face and say this issue is not a subject for this election. Of course it is. Of course it is. And when elected, and I hope that we are able to elect a pro-choice Senate majority, we need to codify Roe, not just count on Dovi Gomez, and we need to eliminate the restrictions that are in current law dealing with waiting periods um, and dealing with uh, language that providers are expected or forced to say that is not medically accurate. Uh, we need to deal with crisis, crisis pregnancy centers that are not pregnancy or healthcare centers at all. And we need to make sure that the freedom that is guaranteed in our constitution for the people in this country is freedom for all of us over our bodies, over our ability to participate in our economy, over our ability, as Dave um, has said, uh, to practice our religious freedom as we choose. All of those Please. questions Complete. have been called into question by a reckless Supreme Court. This election is critically important on that topic. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Kelly Vanger. Um, I would I'll just add, um, I don't have a lot more to add to what my two colleagues have already stated, but I would say that for me, uh, one of the most important things is for us to keep in mind that um, we think that Minnesota, though it is, it is a constitutional right to have an abortion, that our, our Republican colleagues have ensured through the years that they have made uh, access to abortions extremely restrictive, and there have been laws that have been passed that really restrict uh, someone's right to an abortion in a timely manner, and that that last uh, biennium, we actually already had uh, GOP colleagues actually put through bills uh, that further would restrict a woman's right. That is absolutely an issue that is on the ballot this year because uh, we need to ensure that not only do we protect protect women's rights, but we need to remove those laws on the books that are medically unnecessary and actually uh, serve to uh, hold a woman back from being able to get timely uh, access to uh, abortion health care. And so uh, that would be my first priority. And um, I agree with my colleagues that we uh, this is absolutely on the ballot this fall, and there's more for us to do, um, and that we do need to uh, protect a woman's right and uh, enshrine that into our Constitution in a way that uh, is not restrictive. Thank you. Um, Kali, then now we move on to our next question. 
In building a vibrant Minnesota economy, would you emphasize reforming tax policies, addressing income equality, or some other factors? In building a vibrant Minnesota economy, would you emphasize reforming tax policies, addressing income inequality, or some other factors? First on this question is Aaron Murphy. Uh, and there isn't just one answer when we think about building a vibrant economy. One thing that I have loved about serving in the legislature is recognizing that the leadership that we uh, participate in in public life uh, is not limited to people who are elected. Uh, we're also looking to community leaders and business leaders, and together we are working to build that vibrant community, that vibrant economy. Yes, I do think that we probably need to do some reform of our tax code. And I look to my colleague, Kali Her, who has become an expert on this because the tax code does currently favor the rich in the state of Minnesota. But we also have to look at things like the minimum wage and making sure that wage theft doesn't continue to happen so that money, the people that money are, the work that people are doing to earn um, their living um, goes into their pockets. And last, we need to continue to invest in things like education, and infrastructure here in the state of Minnesota, like transit and transportation. So people want to live here, work here, and raise their families here. There's not one answer to a vibrant economy, and it will take all of us to build it and all of us to participate in it. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Next, we have Robert Bouchard. Uh, I would say in the last two years, the DFL has done wonders for our economy, killing a lot of restaurants, shutting us down for two years over the flu. I understand it was a very bad flu, but to put a woman in jail because she kept her restaurant open down in Albert Lee is insane. We need some freedom in this country, freedom for businesses to work and grow, and uh, some a little relief from uh, the government on uh, getting permits, et cetera. That's all I got. Thank you, Robert. Next, we have Kelly Vang here. Thank you, and um, you know, the, the Democrats actually have worked really hard to support our small businesses uh, and also expanding uh, business, uh, expanding uh, funding for uh, minority-owned businesses. We've actually done quite a bit in investing in the economy into uh, uh, people who are looking to do innovative, uh, to be innovative in their businesses. So um, I don't know which state some of my, uh, panel members have been in, but uh, Minnesota has invested deeply into our uh, businesses here. Um, I would also work on tax policy reform um, that is absolutely needed. Um, we are non-conforming in many of our tax um, codes, and so we need to work on that. But I'd also say that in addition to what's already been stated, I would also work on housing and affordable housing, that this is a statewide issue. We need to ensure that um, everyone who wants to live here uh, has ability to access housing. And um, I would say that we have done a great job in the state of Minnesota, that just in the city of St. Paul, we've actually grown the population by almost 10% uh, as of the last census, um, and that we actually have a more diverse workforce than we've ever had. And so I think that it's really important for us to continue the work that we've done in investing in our businesses and in our communities. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, next, we have Dave Pinto. As been said, there's so many elements to this, but I, it feels to me like this is a good opportunity, a really nice opportunity to just compare kind of basic philosophies, right? Um, uh, my colleagues and I feel that investing in people, and the people that are the ones who make our economy, and that that's what the investments we need to make, um, you get on the other side a sense that, um, you know, like the response to COVID, well, let's just kind of all do our own thing, and, and the illness just goes through, and, and, um, and if that messes things up, well, then that's, that's where we are. I want to compare it to Wisconsin. In 2010, there was a Republican governor elected in a Republican legislature, and a lot of policy changes, and what you've seen in the past 12 years is that Wisconsin uh, taking a very different approach with um, cutting taxes and cutting government services has been in a much worse position than our state has been economically, that our model has worked very, very well. And to my mind, you've got a natural experiment, these two states right next to one another, about the kind of approach to take. So we can talk about some of the individual details, but the overall approach to say what we need to do is invest in people, that's the solution, having a strong economy. Thank you, Dave. And we last on this question is Dan Walsh. Thank you. Well, you know, it's refreshing to hear a complex issue doesn't revolve around one-on-one -on -one factor solution. It seems like the last few years, everything revolves around one-on-one -on -one factor solution. And 
certainly economic development is not a one-factor solution. In fact, what's the first thing you need for economic development? Safe communities, because what do you need? You need investors, you need people with money to bring it in to develop business. Along with that, you know, Minnesota is the third corporate tax in terms of the, the kinetic, not kinetic, New York, and maybe is it California? Yeah, there, there's, there's something to put out there that's we're right there up there with those two. So deregulation is always going to be part of economic development because as you stifle businesses, certainly oversight and things that do need to be taken care of should be taken care of. But overregulation, overtaxation is just how you get a $9 billion surplus, right? So you want economic development, have a safe community, first and foremost, attract investors by bringing in advantageous environments for them to, to then invest their money and grow the opportunities that then you can employ people and have a healthy economy. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. This next question uh, is, what ideas do you have to address the increase in crime in our area and make our community safer? What ideas do you have to address the increase in crime in our area and make our community safer? And this one we begin with Kali. Thank you for the question. So um, there, I think that we have to take a holistic approach to uh, crime, that we can't just look at one piece of what contributes to crime. Uh, we need to, one, um, invest in our uh, police force, which we have done uh, in uh, the legislature that was uh, actually House Majority Democrats, that we actually passed more money to fund police in uh, this uh, these past bienniums than uh, in any other biennium. And uh, we provided uh, support for our police officers and increase in wages and also in uh, providing support with uh, mental health providers to go on calls with our officers. But we've also invested in, in community solutions that we know that when people live in poverty and they lack resources, that, that leads to higher incidence of crime. And I would just point out that I do have uh, one bill that Erin Murphy is at the Senate author of that actually came out of uh, an issue with one of our constituents. And um, that bill actually looks at the crime of our juveniles and being able to create a space that we can actually uh, support those uh, individuals instead of putting them in prison. And uh, there are not many solutions for them. And so we worked with community organizations and with partners in order to come up with a solution. But that bill ultimately did not pass because our Republican colleagues wa walked away from negotiations and no public safety bill was passed. Thank you, Kelly. Next, we have Dan Walsh. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I think I've said enough, but I'll say more for sure because it's the number one issue. But attitude and tone have to change. How many people here know a police officer? Exactly. What's the attitude of the police today? Not real high, is it? They don't feel like they're being supported. And it starts with rhetoric, words matter. Not only that, you know, you have a complex issue that you're trying to solve, again, with a narrative that isn't factual. Let's get to the facts. Let's start disseminating data to the, to the people so they can better understand that, no, the institution isn't corrupt from top to bottom. You have a cadet academy you can't fail and you have attrition on the back end. I don't think people realize the risk that we have in front of us today. So change the tone, change the attitude. Yeah, you can pay more, but unless people are willing to take the job, by the way, not a job, a calling, right? Someone that's willing to go at the bullets and we criticize and critique them, how dare we? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next we have Dave Pinto. That I do. This is the work that I do every day as a prosecutor, and I'm, I suspect I'm the only person up here who has uh, trained police officers in multiple settings, actually all over the state, thousands of officers um, in my work. Um, and you know, words matter. Um, we invest in what we value, um, and I think we've shown in our House DFL in terms of proposing investments uh, that, again, get blocked by the Republican Senate. Um, uh, Dan, I did the comments there talking about how dare we question officers. The officers that I know, and I work very closely with very dedicated law enforcement officers, they welcome the scrutiny of the public because they know that they have a sacred trust and absolutely they want to be accountable for the work that they do. And I have to say the ones that I work with, I'm super proud of in the work that they do. We have a, a, a terrific police force in St. Paul uh, Police Department. Um, so listen, um, uh, crime is a complicated issue. Um, absolutely we need to be holding people accountable for what they do and we need to be recognizing what goes into pulling them along. I will say that law enforcement uh, certainly has a role in crime prevention and addressing crime and so do teachers and so do all of us, yes, every single complete. one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, next is Aaron Murphy. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, 
We all deserve to live in safe communities. None of us want to live in fear. Uh, I think we have been through an incredible couple of years here in the state of Minnesota between COVID and the murder of George Floyd. And I am very proud to be here today with Dave Pinto and with Kali Herr. They are both representatives of the Minnesota House who worked very hard to advance funding for and public safety uh, legislation that was intended to keep us safe in our communities. Kaleem mentioned that we do have somebody in the district that we represent that uh, suffered from a carjacking. We worked very hard on a piece of legislation, but it did fail in the Minnesota Senate under the leadership of the Republicans. But as Dave has said, it's gonna take more than making sure that there's adequate funding for law enforcement and accountability for law enforcement. We have to think about the fundamental things of life, safe houses, adequate health care, good education, uh, all of those things together, plus safety in our communities and public safety are the ingredients that build safe communities where we live together and thrive. And those are the things that I want to do when reelected to represent you in the Minnesota Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And last, we have Robert. I kind of agree with what uh, they had just said, but the reality is uh, all this crime is due to climate change. What's the climate? The climate, it's okay to commit a crime. Can you get busted? Ah, oh, you're out of there in 10 minutes, no big deal. Um, George Floyd, who was not murdered, by the way, um, if he would have uh, served out his entire 10 year sentence for putting a gun into a pregnant woman's belly, demanding money, if he would have served that entire 10 years, he'd still be alive in jail today. The climate has changed to be pro-crime, and that's got to stop. Thank you, Robert. Uh, the next question is, what do you see as the impact of climate change in Minnesota, and what specific legislative initiatives would you support to combat climate change? And here we're talking about environmental climate change, uh, just to be clear on the question. So what do you see as the impact of environmental climate change in Minnesota, and what specific legislative initiatives would you support to combat, combat climate change? And this round, we begin with Robert. Uh, gee, I think, uh, I think we ought to face the reality that um, 50 years from now, we're gonna be underwater, but we don't know what's gonna happen two weeks from now. Uh, we just have uh, weather patterns. That's all. That's my answer. I wouldn't do anything. Uh, thank you, Robert. Next we have Dan Walsh. Thank you. Who knows Bjorn Lomberg? Anyone? Anyone heard Bjorn Lomberg? Right? He's kind of the originator of all the above, which means that when it makes sense, it's feasible, and it truly is an alternative. Right? We talk about alternatives, but 3% of the state energy comes from right, alternative sources, 3%. So what are you gonna do with the other 97? Are we gonna continue to push a rope uphill or are we gonna step back and say, let's get a debate going first, right, where you don't get canceled for bringing up an alternative opinion because there's a lot of science out there that does contradict the favorite narrative that right, we hear all the time. So first, open and honest communication open and honest debate, all of the above, when it makes sense, let's implement. When it doesn't make sense, it doesn't scale, then we don't, right? We're like lucky enough to have two nuclear power plants. Look at France, look at Germany. Look at that as your use case, and then tell me what you think. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, next, we have uh, Kali. So uh, scientists have already told us that climate change is real and that conversation is always ongoing, but we do know that the data shows us that climate change is real. And so what I will continue to do is invest in renewable energy sources. Um, I think that it is really important for us to understand that there is, um, we already have extreme climate pattern changes now, and so we have to work with our cities uh, within our state to work on um, climate resiliency plans, that we are very soon going to have climate refugees, and people always think that it is going to be people 
coming into uh, areas like Minnesota, but we within our own state will have climate refugees. So we need to actually work on what does it mean to give people the resources they need to combat the extreme weather patterns that, are, that we're seeing here. Um, I also had the opportunity to go to COP26 in Spain and uh, learned a lot about indigenous solutions that they already have done amazing climate work uh, before we got here. and. Um, and so we need to go back to implementing some of these uh, indigenous uh, solutions and then uh, also invest in new ways to sequester carbon. And we do know that plants and uh, sequestering carbon into the earth is probably one of the most effective ways to do that. And so more investment uh, Please, and uh, education around that issue. Thank you. Um, Kelly, next we have Erin. Thank you, Kitty. It is... Uh, it is hard not to think about this question without uh, reflecting on what we've just seen happen in Florida. Uh, and we know that uh, the intensity of large storms like hurricanes, or the damage that we're seeing in the wildfires to the west, uh, the pressure that we're going to continue to hear and feel as people want to buy the fresh water from the Great Lakes are all the signs that not only is the science right, but climate, the change in our climate is having ramifications in the way that we lead our lives. I serve on the Ag Committee. I'm the lead of the Ag, on the Ag Committee. There's a lot of possibility and solution in agriculture in Minnesota, one of our largest industries. If we don't act, one of our largest industries is going to be severely impacted by the changes of climate. There are all sorts of things that we can do. And it, when we think about greening our economy, um, building that new infrastructure that is going to drive renewables, the innovation that is going to come from that, the tools of conservation, Please our complete. work in agriculture and transportation, those sectors, all of that is great opportunity with upside for us. But Please if we stop. don't act and act swiftly, we're going to have real problems here in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, next question. What changes in voting rights legislation do you support and why? What changes... Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Apologize with that. Uh, we do have one more person on this question. Uh, Dave. No, uh, thanks, Katie. No problem. Um, as, a, so as an advocate for young kids, I, I think of this as an intergenerational responsibility. I mean, our children, our grandchildren, I mean, I hope everybody up here cares about their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. They will be cursing us for having failed to act year after year. Um, but as Aaron said, it really, you don't have to wait decades. Um, we can see this right now. Farmers can see this. Uh, people can see that, that there's the changes. And I will say that, you know, 20 some years ago, I was in graduate school and we did, a, did an exercise uh, that involved some of the data about climate change. And the predictions that they had for what we're going to be coming in the following 20 years, that's where it's been. I'm not a climate expert. Um, and I don't think anybody up here is either. The people who are, the people who spend their time doing this, are telling us the trajectory we're on. We need to take action. We need to take it now. Kalia and I are both members of the House Climate Action Caucus. I think it may be just in the House, but I know that Aaron would be embarrassed you're on that too. Yeah, we're, we are. Um, we need to take action, and it is a responsibility that we think there's nothing more precious than our children, our grandchildren. Um, and what we've seen so far is nothing compared to what they'll see. We need to act. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Next question, what changes in voting rights legislation do you support and why? What changes in voting rights legislation do you support and why? And first on this one is Erin. The right to vote is a sacred franchise in the United States of America guaranteed by our Constitution. And when I hear elected officials talking about limiting the, by the right to vote, uh, whether or not you can speak English, as Kim Crockett has said, has been a reason why she wants to limit the right to vote. Uh, whether or not you're disabled is a reason she wants to limit the right to vote. Uh, and she continues to wonder about if the election of 2020 was real, if it was accurate. Uh, we need to make sure and we protect the right to vote here in Minnesota and across this country because it is our tool together to build our future. I support automatic voter registration. I'm very interested in ranked choice voting um, as a tool to change the way that we are engaging in our politics and in our discussions around elections. Uh, but I do think that it is time for us to take a, a strong, uh, comprehensive look at campaign finance here in the state of Minnesota, um, at the way that we conduct when and, and how we conduct our primary, in the multitude of ways that we are participating in our elections to make sure that everybody has access um, as easily as possible to continue to make sure that the vote is strong here in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Dave? 
as Aaron said, this is the right upon which all others depend, is the right to vote. Um, we, are, we should be so proud that in our state we have the highest voter turnout in the country. It's a statement of confidence in our vote, in our, in our, our state. And one, of the, one silver lining to all the questioning that's gone on and the, and the conspiracy theories is that I at least have learned, I hope others have as well, about the process that goes into our elections. Um, the process of having people from multiple parties at every single stage, the fact that it's counted at the local level with pe people watching at every step. Um, we can have great confidence in that. I support the reforms that Aaron mentioned. I'd like to go a step further in campaign finance or just to describe a little more. Um, there's the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court that said that corporations have the same free speech rights as human beings. Um, to my mind, that is not something that, that should stand. That should be changed. But even under those Supreme Court rulings, the court has made clear that we can have greater transparency about campaign finance and spending. We should be disclosing who is contributing to our campaigns to understand what that is about. And so we've advanced that over time, and I want to continue doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And next we have Dan Walsh. Uh, thank you. You know, honestly, I don't see it as a huge issue because most people I've ever talked to, most people I interface with, have the ability to vote, get out to vote. I think 46 days is a little, a little aggressive. You know, do we really need 46 days um, in order to uh, vote? I don't believe so. And I also think that, again, looking at national surveys, looking at what people say, voter ID, 80%. It's not even a partisan issue, it's bipartisan. So in terms of election voting, Minnesota seems to do it well. Here's the thing. We always are so eager to change things. You know, this, and I would argue the Democrat Party the last two or three years has been the, the party of change. Well, some change could reform elections, but really, I think we do a good job. I don't think there's a ton to be done other than maybe limit 46 days, and voter ID is a legitimate scenario, and it should be discussed further. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Colleague? Um, I would say that I just would like to add on to what Aaron and Dave have already said is I also want to um, protect our election judges that we are seeing that um, Republicans have uh, in, in a sort of uh, started placing their own people within uh, the voting polls uh, because they believe that it's wrought with fraud which is not true and there's not data to support that and so I would say the protection of our election judges and oversight over this process so that that does not become partisan and that those election judges are able to um, oversee uh, the process and that we allow them to do their job without intimidation. Thank you, Kelly. And Robert. <clears throat> I'm an election judge, so I understand that it's a, it's a pretty good uh, operation we got. The problem is when you have 50% of the ballots are mailed in absentee, uh, over, and you need to have equal representation on the election uh, boards, on the ballot boards. And I would outlaw private funding of election administration, outlaw mail-in ballots and drop, off, and drop boxes. I would enact money quality ballots like with a watermark on the ballots or can't be copied. Uh, and I would have absentee, absentee ballot uh, voting only for legitimate reasons. And uh, I would outlaw ranked choice voting because I don't believe in it. And as far as election fraud is concerned, uh, Michael Myers, a former Democrat congressman who was uh, expelled from Congress for bribery, just, was just convicted of stuffing ballot boxes in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18, but maybe not in 20. So that's my answer. Thank you, Robert. Next question. Internet access for children is necessary for lifelong success. What do you think we can do to achieve nearly 100% access uh, to the internet across Minnesota? Dave? Thank you for the question, um, and not an area that I feel like I've got great expertise in, but I, but I will note that we should recognize that internet access um, is absolutely critical, and as your question um, uh, stated, and we really need to think of it as being part of the infrastructure of participating in our society. We have um, transportation and transit, um, you know, there's water utilities, et cetera, making sure that every single person has access is, is critical. Um, 
I've been really proud of our St. Paul School District for providing support for kids. Um, you know, I will admit that when they first talked about giving kids iPads, I kind of said, well, now, wait a second, really? Is that how that's going to work? As I've seen in my own kids who are in the public schools, um, I've seen that that's been incredibly powerful. And it's allowed every child to have the access that they need. Um, as an early childhood advocate, I'm kind of happy that they don't do that for younger kids. But once a kid is in kindergarten and, and on up at different levels, they have the iPad at school, et cetera, that really is a powerful way that we can, uh, that we can give access. But it starts with saying that it's not kind of a luxury or thing on the side. It's something that is absolutely fundamental to learning and to access in our society. Thank you, Dave. Next we have Kali. I actually had the uh, privilege of working on this during the uh, pandemic. Um, I was uh, Mayor Carter's policy director during the time, and I worked with the school district uh, on bridging that digital divide. And we know that there are issues of equity within the digital divide. And so I worked with Comcast and a number of other uh, cable providers and Wi-Fi providers so that we could uh, have a service in a community center so that our children could continue to do their homework while uh, they were studying from home. And so uh, the Democrats, uh, Democrats believe in the same thing. Last year, we passed an uh, infrastructure bill that included comp uh, broadband into rural Minnesota, so we need to make sure that all of our children are connected. But this is not just an issue of rural Minnesota. We have dead zones here in the Twin Cities as well, and so how do we ensure that we are investing, as Dave said, in the infrastructure of ensuring that everybody has access? I am in Woodbury quite a bit because I knock a lot in Woodbury, and within that area, the Wi-Fi, it's really difficult to get connection even there. And so we do need to do a better job of ensuring that our programs are affordable, and I have had the opportunity to work with Comcast and, and NBC to ensure that um, low-income families are able to access um, Wi-Fi and uh, get access to broadband services uh, wherever they live. And so I will continue to do that work. Thank you, Kelly. Next, we have Erin. Thank you, Kitty. And I will just build upon uh, what Dave and Clea have both talked about. Uh, we need to make sure that wherever you live, uh, your access is reliable and affordable. You can count on it. Uh, we know how important it is now to our kids' learning, but it's also important in the delivery of health care, in the, in the ag industry, in business and commerce, uh, and, and in the ways that we connect with one another, especially when you think about what we've been through in the last couple of years. And while I'm not wanting to Zoom anymore, thank goodness we could Zoom at the height of the pandemic. Reliable and affordable internet is critical, and on the Ag Committee, we have fought for the last two years and pushed the Republicans in the Senate to make sure that we were taking advantage of the federal funds that were coming to the state of Minnesota to, so that we were delivering broadband across the state of Minnesota where people are underserved or completely, completely unserved. So we're meeting the commitment and the obligation that we have to the people so they can have access to that necessary tool. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Robert? I agree with everything the Democrats said. We have an area of people agreeing. Wonderful. <laughs> Would you care to expound or leave it at that? Well, I, I know it's really important to get it out there to the farming community. Like I said, I agree with what they said. Thank you. Dan? Thank you. Uh, you know, working in technology the last 40 years, I would, I would couple things. One, we're well behind other advanced nations in terms of laying fiber, that is true. Um, deregulation. Again, could be a definite advantage to layering more fiber, more competition, things along those lines will then increase the ability to get broadband and DSL out to communities that might not have it. I'd also very much challenge the idea of remote learning. You know, if you look at corporate America, corporate America is trying to bring people in, why? We know the degradation it did to our kids. That's, I think, not even in debate anymore. But corporate America is bringing people in because they see statistically people don't communicate as well, they don't innovate as well. So that's why you're seeing a lot of push to bring people back into the office because the data shows that remote or external learning or things along those lines is not productive. And I'd also add that it is a dangerous tool. And those that don't think it's dangerous, think twice because it is. Please wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, next question. Um, what strategies or legislation would you use to address transportation issues? Have your strategies or views changed on transportation since we've seen shifts in road use, public transportation use, work from home models, etc., due to the pandemic? What strategies or legislation would you use to address transportation issues? 
Have your strategies or views changed on transportation since we've seen shifts in road use, public transportation use, work from home models, et cetera, due to the pandemic? And on this question, we begin with Dave. Well, again, another question about infrastructure, um, internet access being one, and then with this, recognizing that um, it's not just roads and bridges, though it is a, though that is a, certainly a key part of it. Um, it's about having a, a robust multimodal tran transportation system um, that allows people and goods to get to the different places that they need to be in a variety of different ways, recognizing climate impact, et cetera. So um, uh, I've been supportive of having uh, a, um, a gas tax as being a possible way to fund um, uh, our transportation system and, and recognizing that, um, that we need to have uh, that be a component and uh, make sure that there's funding that goes in um, and that we're really investing in the variety of different ways. Minnesota you know, has, I think, um, some of the largest number of highway miles of any state in the country, um, and, and that takes a lot of money to keep those up. And so we need to make sure that we're investing in that and that we're allowing people all the different options um, of transit, of biking, of pedestrian, um, and a variety of different things as well. This historically is not something we've invested in as a country, and we need to. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Uh, thank you, Kitty. My views have changed some in the last uh, 12 to 14 years on this issue of transportation in that I have, especially during COVID, become a much stronger pedestrian, and I'm great, grateful to live in a place where I can do many of the things that I want to do by foot. Um, and I really respect those who like to take their bike and get from point A to point B. Uh, I think it is important for today and for our future to make sure that people can get to where they need to go uh, in a variety of ways. So I have uh, adult children. They don't want to have a two-car family anymore. They would like to be able to manage with one car. Uh, that's going to require better bus service, better transit, uh, and reliability in, in all of those methods. And then the last thing I will say is I am very excited about the evolution of electronic vehicles, electronic vehicles, electric, excuse me, electric vehicles, and the charging stations that are coming online, uh, funded both here in Minnesota and by the federal government. That, that's going to be a really important innovation for the state of Minnesota. You can't get everywhere on your bike or on your feet, so you do need a vehicle. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Next, we have Robert. Hmm. I don't like the idea of raising the gas tax at all. Uh, right now, we're having a tough time paying for gas the way it is, especially when you get your car jacked right after filling up. And I think uh, one way to address that would be to make carjacking a hate crime. Now, that is a transportation question. Um, that's about all I got. I mean, it's, uh, I, well, wait a second, no, wait. You know, I think we're pushing to uh, go elect, uh, to electric, or we're going away, uh, transitioning to an electronic world and abandoning reliable energy which is what we're going to need this winter. If you're not paying attention to what's going on in Europe, they're burning wood. They're planning on burning wood this winter because they don't have any energy coming from Russia. We're going to have a problem with energy too. And uh, so I want to I want to develop uh, fossil fuels. Thank you, Robert. Kelly? Um, I just want to add to what Dave and Aaron already stated, but for me, looking at transportation through an equity lens is really important. Um, you know, I am also a biker. Uh, I like to, um, you know, walk to the places that I can, which is why I choose to live in St. Paul is because things are easily accessible to me. But I also know that as we're looking at building out bike paths, we're building out beautiful pathways, which I think we absolutely need. But that doesn't help that when a family who lives in that low income community, let's say at Mount Airy is trying to get to their gas station, they can't use those bike paths. So like I want to build bike paths and infrastructure that allows people to get from their homes to their jobs, not just something that we do for leisure. I'm looking at uh, bus lines and light rail into low-income neighborhoods that we know that on the east side, our kids now are relying on public transportation because of the cost of transportation has on education, uh, you know, the traditional yellow bus. And so we actually don't have very good uh, bus um, lines out to the east side, and that is actually primarily where black and brown and low-income uh, our communities are. And so we need to do a better job of looking at our transportation and look at the equity component of it ensuring that we are putting routes through neighborhoods in which we've traditionally neglected from doing so. So that's important to me. Thank you, Kelly. And last we have Dan. Thank you. I bike every day. You know, I bike every single day. You know, and Minnesota is number one in bike pass. You know what we don't need? More bike pass. 
Just go up and down Summit, look at the signs. I think they've spoken. So in terms of transportation, what's the Southwest light rail doing? How's that doing, right? 500 million behind or something, gonna potentially bankrupt Hennepin County. How has the light rail even produced? I think it's 33 cents subsidized per mile per rider or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, transportation's important. Someone please call Mayor Carter and let him know that I got a leaky front tire because of the potholes in St. Paul. Let's start with basics. Fix what we got, right? Take care of what we got and then let's build a plan, let's build a strategy. But we're running to just spend money, spend money, and we gotta pull that back because guess what? Most of the people I know can get where they need to go. And yeah, I love bikes too, okay? But we don't need to spend any more on bike pass and we don't need to do anything more with paid pass. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next question. Some of you have already stated that you would revamp the tax code. Could you all share how you would revamp the tax code? Could you all share how you would revamp the tax code? This begins with Robert. First off, I would uh, eliminate uh, state tax on Social Security benefits. Um, and I think we need, I'm, I'm not real good at uh, these tax laws, but uh, I'm sure there's experts around that can help us uh, when we're elected to uh, lower the taxes across the board. Uh, and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Kylie? Um, Minnesota has uh, issues with tax conformity, and so I would work on some of the places in which we could actually work on those pieces of it. But I would also say that for me, I was the, co the chief author of the um, fifth tier income bill, which uh, puts the tax code, uh, the income tax, back to pre Trump levels. Um, so it doesn't increase it, but it puts it back to the level before Trump reduced it for uh, the richest uh, Americans. And so my bill would actually um, you know, tax our highest income earners who uh, make a million dollars or more in order for us to um, really build out the, the, um, the fully funding the things that we need like education and transportation and housing um, and so I would actually continue to work on that particular bill and then also on some of the uh, tax credit bills that we worked on the child tax credit bill the housing uh, the rental tax credit um, also uh, looking at uh, the student loan tax credit as well so uh, you know there's much that we can do to actually help Minnesotans that put money back into their pockets by looking at tax policies Thank you, Kelly. Next we have Aaron. Senate author of that fifth tier income tax bill, and I'm going to continue to work on that with Kelly. Uh, tax policy uh, has a lot to do uh, with uh, the way that we lead our lives, um, and I would like to make the tax code here in Minnesota more progressive. Um, it's one of the reasons why I authored that fifth tier uh, income tax uh, increase. Uh, we've heard mention today of the, the surplus that we have in the state of Minnesota, and we do, and it's in part because the economy really overperformed for some. Some did very well during COVID. Um, we have a surplus, but it's one-time money. And if we want to build a future reliably, we need to do more than one-time money. It's like saying I've got $50 in my drawer, and we're going to buy a car and, and, and pay for it with that $50. That $9 billion is a lot of money. We can do, do a lot of good on things like housing and one-time expenditures. But to build our future is going to rely on ongoing funding. The tax code has got to, to recognize that, and we have to make sure that people who work for a living are getting their face shake in that tax code. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Next, we have Dan. Thank you. Uh, Minnesota 6 in income tax nationally. So um, I think we're collecting enough tax. In fact, over time, if you look at history, I know we want to cancel history, I know we want to challenge history, rigorously debate history, but when you have seen tax, because we're talking about a rate, right? We talk about tax in different terms, but it's just a rate. And when the tax rate gets lowered, there's been multiple examples over the course of history where revenue goes up. Why is that? Because people aren't gonna try to you know, hide money, move money, whatever. Whatever they can do to not pay tax, right? We need to simplify the tax code. That's first and foremost. You know, talk to Ernst & Young, PwC, Anderson, uh, KPMG. They love the tax code the way it is. They bring the auditors in, they bring the tax lawyers in, they bill about three to $500 an hour, simplify the tax, make it easy to understand for the consumer or for the constituent. 
Um, and you know what? Lower the rate. And by the way, you might get higher revenues. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And last on this question is Dave. Well, the, the challenge is, right, when, uh, when we're making decisions about policy and investments, you're figuring out the money coming in and then the investments that go out. Um, when there is uh, less money available to spend, what that means is that you have lower public services you're, that you're able to afford. Um, I, I think that, that history has, has doubted that point, uh, that somehow by, having, uh, by lowering that rate that, in fact, overall more money is going to come in. And the concern is uh, that that then um, starves Minnesotans from services that really make a difference for them, and I would actually argue it's just the opposite, that when you invest in people, that in fact they then uh, can generate uh, services and goods and can produce more, and that has been the history of our state. We have tended to be a higher tax state and a state that has had higher services and has been more productive and had an extremely strong economy. So that has been the connection that's been made um, through all that. It does seem to me that um, our state has this uh, strong reliance on uh, property taxes in some ways. We want to make sure that we're that we're, um, that we're having it be that the wealthiest and the corporations are paying their share as they're benefiting from, um, from the great state that we've built. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. The next question. What is the state government's role in increasing affordable housing? What is the state government's role in increasing affording affordable housing? And I think a co I'm going to add a corollary to that, which is what do you support in terms of the government doing? So what is the state's role and what do you support? At what action do you support the state government take? In this question, uh, we are going to begin with Erin. Thank you. Uh, we have talked about safety before, uh, and I believe everybody uh, deserves to live safely and freely in the state of Minnesota, and foundationally, housing is a part of that. Uh, if we want a healthy community, housing is a part of that. That we tolerate, and we do as a community and as a people, we tolerate those who live without a safe place to live, uh, is not in keeping with what I think about in terms of Minnesota. So as a state, I do believe we have an obligation to make sure that everybody has a safe place to live. Uh, housing is incredibly expensive for people. We have used bonding and direct appropriation um, to make sure that we are building affordable housing and maintaining affordable housing. Uh, there has been a lot of work, and you're going to hear from Kali, who's expert on this, uh, dealing with renters and renters' instability uh, and tenants' rights. There are many interventions that we can take together as people to enact that goal, which everybody deserves a safe place to live, a place that they can call home. And we've got to do Please. that work together. Thank you. Thank you. And next on this question, we have Dave. Agreed that we need to recognize this as just a, a, a fundamental thing that people need. I mean, each one of us needs a, a, a stable, safe place to live that we can afford. Uh, and that um, not doing that not only does us moral injury, is a, I would hope a violation of, of what we would believe, what we want for our fellow human beings, but also makes us all worse off as well. Um, so we really want to make sure that people have, have an affordable, stable, safe place to live. What can the state do? So the state has that role. What can it do? Um, well, a series of things. It seems to me that, that a critical point is to make sure that we have a greater supply of affordable places to live. Um, we know that there are smaller communities in particular where um, employers would like to hire people for jobs, but there's not workforce housing for people to be living. So there's an example of something where the state can be helping out in that community. Um, and just more, we want to make sure that there are, are a greater number of places to live and recognize that there is, to a certain extent, a market failure in terms of saying, that we're going to be able to be uh, providing, simply have people be able to afford um, on their own. They may need some assistance, and as they build up, they get better off. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Colleen? Um, I think that uh, what we always hear from our GOP colleagues is that competition drives down prices. But what we have seen in housing is that competition does not drive down prices. It is actually a housing uh, costs have skyrocketed. I think that government's role is oversight over um, building standards, but also over predatory practices in housing that actually take advantage of our seniors and of uh, first-time homeowners and of uh, people who may, may not have the savvy to understand what building a house up to code would look like. And so I believe that government needs to have oversight over that. We also have a very complex system of which we have credits in order to build affordable 
affordable housing. There's been a big shift from federal government funding affordable housing to a state's responsibility. And there are uh, complex processes in place. And so government needs to make sure that they oversee that those processes are equitably and fairly um, distributed. And uh, I'd also include that within that for those who want to continue to rent, that uh, our tenant protection laws are uh, some of the oldest uh, in the country and that we need to continue to work on and government needs to uh, oversee that and ensure that tenants are protected. Please complete. And I would just want to add one thing, that the government is the one that understands the disproportionate impact to people uh, who've been disenfranchised from owning homes historically. And so putting together programs that uh, close that gap in wealth uh, in owning homes is absolutely necessary, and government needs to oversee that as well. Thank you, Kelly. Next we have Dan. Uh, thank you. As a licensed real estate broker in the state of Minnesota and, you know, landlord for over 20 years, I can tell you exactly what you know, the role of government should be limited at best, right? I remember 2005, 2006, where I was cutting deals to get people into uh, units, you know, one month free, um, scrambling to try to do my best to fill the, the vacancy. And, and I also, let's say this year, I spent over $20,000 on rentals to make sure that they were um, competitive, that I could get tenants in. Uh, the market does drive behavior. And we saw rent control come into the city of St. Paul, uh, historically has failed everywhere except for two places, San Francisco and New York. Guess where the most two expensive places to live are? San Francisco and New York. You have over 400, 400 houses that are registered vacant in the city of St. Paul. You wanna get more supply going? Get level three and level two vacancies. Get those restrictions removed so private investors can come in and put those back on the stock nice. like I did 20 plus years ago when I took Please depressed complete. housing and put it back on the tax rolls. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Robert? Uh, when I'm walking around uh, door knocking, I've seen a lot of houses that look like uh, nobody lived in them. And they had these, uh, like the realtor key lock on them and I didn't understand why there were so many like in nativity and whatever and apparently these houses aren't even on the market. Uh, I've always thought that uh, the east side of St. Paul is affordable housing it just needs some police protection so people will move there and take care of their property and uh, I thank you for the time. Thank you Robert. Uh, for the last round we're going to be really brief here in five words or less, what do you believe is the District 64's greatest strength or asset? In five words or less, what do you believe is District 64's greatest strength or asset? This is called, we have a little bit of time left, but not for a whole round of questions. <laughs> so we're gonna begin this one with Kylie. Um, I'm just going to say it's the people. Super. Um, Dan? It's the community of people. Yes, I would agree. Thank you. Robert? Me. Okay. Um, Dave? Aaron. Strength is us. Great. Thank you. Including you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, in closing, we apologize if your question was not asked. We can never get to all the issues in a limited format such as this. We encourage you to speak to the candidates directly at the closing of the forum. Uh, closing statements will be given in reverse order from the opening statements. Please remember you have two minutes to conclude your remarks. First uh, for closing statements is Dave Pinto. Uh, thank you to the league and thanks Kitty. Uh, that was actually a nice way to end on that last question because I was going to thank all four of the people up here and also Lorraine, uh, my is not here, for stepping up to run for office. Again, in a couple of your cases and, and uh, to the gentleman as well. Um, I feel like this has been... 
um, a good reminder to me of what we need to hang on to as a country and as people, um, right, is we're going to disagree uh, about various issues. Uh, we don't need to be disagreeable, and we need to recognize what we share, our, our humanity, and, uh, and that we share this country, and it's so critical we, that we do that. And there are different views on issues, and that's important, too. And I think um, folks have gotten a pretty nice sense of some of the contrast um, between our philosophies. Um, I believe, and I think we believe, um, that we need to invest in people. Um, the government is all of us acting together. It's not the enemy, it's all of us acting together. Um, and that we can do amazing things when we make, do those investments and we do in fact act together. Um, I've been really honored for the past um, eight years now, it's incredible um, for that time, to represent this community in the Minnesota House, um, to work on your behalf, um, in particular on issues of community safety and on um, young kids and on a wide variety of issues as well. I'm an honor to serve you as a prosecutor as well in my work outside the legislature. Um, I'd be very honored to continue to serve um, for you in the coming term. Um, I can tell you that I'm really excited about that work, about that opportunity. Um, I'm working very hard, I should say, um, to try to have an influence on what happens in the election in early November. Um, and then that after that, uh, we make sure that we are taking advantage of the many opportunities that we have and addressing the many challenges that we have. Um, I have no doubt that when we give everybody in our state an opportunity to thrive, um, that our state and all of us will be better off, that in fact we do that for each one of us, that all of us are going to be better off. Um, and that's why my approach has been everybody in. We need every, all of us in. Our democracy can't be a spectator sport. We need everybody to be involved. I'm so grateful to those of you in the room, those of you watching this, and please continue to participate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave Pinto. Next we have Aaron. Thank you very much, Kitty, and to everybody, uh, including everybody up here on this panel. It's been a, a great debate this evening. I am excited about this election. I have spent so much of the last year talking with Minnesotans all across the state, and one thing that is crystal clear to me uh, when you talk with Minnesotans is they care about each other. We care about each other, and we really do want Minnesota to succeed. And we should take full advantage of that when we think about the work that we're gonna do together to build a future that includes all of us, in which all of us can thrive. I was frustrated, as as frustrated could be at the end of last session, when we left Sine Die without completing the work of the people of Minnesota. And we shouldn't tolerate that anymore. That's not the kind of politics that solves problems. That's not how we build our future. And it was okay for my colleagues, my Senate Republicans, to sit down on the job and let that time pass without finishing the job. It's really deplorable. We shouldn't do that again. When we come back into this next term, we're going to take these, the people who are running for office. We're going to do the work of the people of Minnesota. We're going to make progress for all of us. And I don't want to sugarcoat it. It is not easy work. Even if Democrats hold both the House and the Senate with Governor Walls, if we're that lucky to get elected, the work of building our future is not going to be easy work, and it's going to take not just those of us who are elected, but all of us together um, to be clear about what it is that we want to accomplish. Um, we're going to rely on the people in this district and the people in the state of Minnesota to help support and push and nudge and pull to make sure that the priorities that are important to the state of Minnesota are the priorities that become part of that structurally balanced budget and the work that we do in the next two years for the people of Minnesota. I have so much faith in us. I believe in you and I believe in us. And I know that we can build a bright future for everybody in the state of Minnesota when we decide that politics is not as important as is our people. Thank you very much for having me tonight. Thank you, Aaron Murphy. Next, we have Dan Walsh. I don't know if anyone here is a fan of the Godfather trilogies, but you know, there's a good saying, you know, it's not personal, it's just business, right? And I could tell you the business of District 64, uh, A, B, and Senate um, has been Democrat. Look at the history. Since 1972, when they identified Republican or Democrat, how many people have been a Republican that have held office in District 64? One. 1982. So it's very simple for me. If you like the trajectory of the city, if you like the way it's going in the area, your choice is very simple. If you don't, then change has to happen. Change has never happened. It's a one-party city. So if you're looking for things to move forward in different directions, 
then you have to vote the other way. But historically, it hasn't happened. And I don't anticipate it happening this year, to be completely honest. You know, when I threw my hat in the ring, it was because it is about the democratic process. It is about not letting people run unopposed. It is about coming up here and giving a different opinion. But it is you, the people, that are going to make the decision. It's always been you, the people. Unfortunately, politics has been about the politician in these recent years, right? I mean, what is the you know, um, like in likelihood or likeness of a politician, right? When they poll and they do surveys, super low. And why wouldn't it be, right? You know, I mean, th what has happened in our government, and I'm not a politician, and I think that's a strength. You know, I come from for-profit corporate America. You know what happens when I make a mistake? I might lose my job. You know what happens when government makes a mistake? Oh, it was an unintended consequence. All these good intentions led to these unfortunate consequences. That story's got to change. You know, there's too much money going out the window, and there's not enough diligence and in oversight being, being happening. So thank you. I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Dan Walsh. Next we have Robert. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here and listening to me. Uh, I'm freezing. Uh, I'm nervous. I've never done this kind of thing before. I'm running because I want to put an end to lockdowns, mandates, crime, inflation, and the war on energy. And I think the way to do it is to vote Republican. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Bouchard. And last, we have Kaylee Bang Her. Uh, thank you, um, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Really appreciate the questions from everyone. It shows what a great district we have and the thoughtful questions presented. Um, also, thank you to everyone who participated. Um, it makes me a better uh, representative when I get to hear both sides, ideas from both sides of the aisle. I think that politics is very complex because we are complex beings, and that the times of us solving problems, looking at one issue at a time, is a time a thing of the past, and that we, and I would say especially in the last few years, have had people, more people elected who just are everyday people because we believe that uh, those are the voices that need to be heard. And I think that it's wonderful that, uh, you know, that some of us here are not politicians. And I can say it's great because Aaron is a nurse and Dave is a, uh, you know, is a prosecutor. And, um, you know, I came from the private sector. I spent 15 years uh, in uh, doing investments and finance work. And I've worked for Fortune 100 companies my entire career. And the truth is, is that, you know, the protection of people in that sector is actually far worse than in the public sector. And uh, the uh, protection of wages and protection protection of uh, worker condition is far worse when you don't have uh, oversight that the government does over the public sector. And so I'm really proud to be in this work. Um, and I think that we have been told that in politics that we have to invalidate each other's perspective in order to make ours real. And the truth is, is I believe that there are multiple truths that can exist in the same reality. That I can be critical of police and public safety and be critical of them, but also honor them and value the work that they do. I come from you know, a family that have many, many police officers and sheriffs. One of the sheriffs that protect us at the Capitol is a, a cousin of mine. And so I can both be critical of an institution that has not always been uh, treated everyone in the system fairly, but also honor the work that is being done. And so as we continue this work, I uh, look forward to continuing to have colleagues who are willing to have the courage to solve complex problems, to look at the intersection of the issues, and uh, bring solutions to the table that are not just going to address one issue, and that we can both have everybody's truths exist in the same reality, even if they are conflicting. And that's how we're going to be a better society. So thank you all for being on this journey with us. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Kylie Vang Her. Um, so now, in closing, we um, let's see here. Thank you. I'd like to remind the audience that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the sponsoring organizations. On behalf of the sponsoring organizations, I would like to thank the candidates for being part of this forum and recognizing them for serving their community through participation in the democratic process and running for public office. I would also like to thank the audience and those at home for watching your candidates' issues that are important to your community. This forum is being video recorded by St. Paul Network Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. Recording of the forum will be available in multiple platforms. Recording of this event, whether they be in person or of a computer screen, may not be used without the express written approval of the League.
The League will only allow audio video of this event to be broadcast in its entirety, except by media reporting on the event. Every vote counts. This year, Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You have the option of early voting, which is already open, and voting by mail. For any questions on voting, go to the Ramsey County website, the Elections and Voting section. Please remember, vote. Thank you and good night.